This is a presentation of left hip pain. And on the pain drawing, you drew on the front and the back of the left hip in the inguinal area. And what I noted in the eval is that the left lower extremity is just a little bit shorter, less than a quarter of an inch shorter than the right. I also found that the distal femur is stuck in posterior glide and so comparing both of them, and I have both hips and uh, both feet together, the left femur is positioned more posteriorly, but it's more a function of how things move than how they look. And I'm going to load and spring this knee, and I'm able to um, take up the slack in the system and then impart a little bit of force, and there's movement that goes through that structure, through that joint. On this side, I can't even take up the slack and I'm doubling and tripling the amount of force that I'm imparting and there's just no give there. The other thing that we noted was full hip range of motion, very a very subtle difference in side to side in terms of rotation, in terms of internal rotation, but it wasn't significant. I also noted that the pelvis doesn't glide from the left to the right very much. It moves a little bit and then it becomes stiff, whereas the pelvis will glide from the right to the left. I can take up the slack and then I can impart a little additional force and it moves. The um, camera probably can't discern the subtlety, but there is a, you know, when I, when I try and spring this ilium backwards, the other side rises immediately and that's unusual. And the same thing happens here. As soon as I push on this, this size rises. And when you were on your stomach, we found that your sacrum was very prominent and you're basically rocking on your sacrum. We also looked at the pubic joint and the very top of the pubic bones are symmetrical going across. But when we come in the midline and we palpate upper third, middle third, and lower third, the left side appears posterior. Well, you could be just laying with your pelvis twisted and then there would be a straight plane and, and uh, that's not what you present with. What you present with is a step down. When I cross from right to left, I step down onto the left pubic bone at the upper, middle, and lower third. And I'm not sure the camera can see that, but it's more of a felt um, thing. It's, it's, uh, that there's another way to demonstrate that, if you would lie on your stomach, please. The ischium on the lower third of your buttock is prominent on the left side. It's closer to the ceiling. And when I try and spring it, I can't take up the slack with a reasonable amount of force. Therefore, I can't spring it. I can't get movement to traverse through that structure into the rest of your body. On the right side, I can take up the slack. And that's about 15 pounds of force. And then I can impart an additional force. And I can see your feet move. And I can see movement through this part of your body as well. So you have a posterior glide of the left pubic bone, which is a pattern I discovered back in the early 80s. And it's not in the literature um, regarding pubic joint dysfunction or sacroiliac joint dysfunction. The other finding we have is that the sacrum appears posterior. When I come from the PSIS, I should fall down into a sulcus, but I actually butt up against the sacrum. The sacrum is more posterior. And the sacrotuberous ligaments are down here, but they feel like bone. They're very, very tight. And there is no bone right here. This should be, this is just soft tissue, this part of your anatomy. When I try and spring superiorly, I can't. I'm doubling the amount of force that I usually use and there's just no give. And when I try and spring inferiorly, there's no give there. At the midline on the sacrum, no give. If I try and create anterior rotation through the ilium, the pelvis, there's no give there either. So it appears that through some fall that you had in your past, 
um, you fell on your on your bottom and the SIs gapped a little bit and the upper body force pushed the sacrum posteriorly and it wedged and so there's no movement there. Um, the upper cervical spine on the right is tight at the occipitoatlantal and atlantoaxial joint and that is probably compensatory to the shift in the pubic joint such that when we correct the pubic joint and the knee as well then the upper cervical pattern should free up reflexively because it's a it's probably a compensatory pattern um, we could do some real detailed muscle testing and we would find some reduced uh, strength and endurance in the left hip complex Definitely. I like to defer that because obviously it's going to be inhibited with this kind of a pattern in the knee and the pattern in the pubic joint and the pattern in the in the SI joint so what I like to do is restore normative movements and then test and see what remains so we want to get rid of those things that are reflexively inhibiting or mechanically inhibiting strength and endurance so um, having tested the hip pretty thoroughly your hip motion is is uh, a lot more similar than than it is different from the other side but I do think that shift in the knee is, is relevant um, I think the pubic shift is relevant in the SI pattern as well so let's stop filming and go to work